just for our panelists, I think we'll get started. Um, I see we have our final speaker here as well. And uh, and there's a little stability in the number of participants. So uh, maybe I'll get started. So good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us today um, for this panel discussion on gender-based violence and conflict zones. This is the third seminar in a series looking at healthcare in conflict zones, humanitarian emergencies, and their aftermath. And the, the, the idea of this series really came about in, in last fall as the leadership of the medical school were reflecting about what we, in the scope of an academic institution and in alignment with our mission, could do in light of the challenging situation in the Middle East. While today's panel will not be talking specifically about the refuse, refugee situation caused by the Israel-Hamas war, we will learn from our panelists about the universal lessons and considerations regarding sexual violence during conflict and humanitarian emergencies. And I'm really grateful to our moderator, Dr. Lindsay Orchowski, for bringing this panel together today of experts in this subject matter. Alina Potts, Dr. Emmanuel Contreras Urbina, and Dr. Erica Hardy. I'm going to now introduce Dr. Ochowski, and then I'm going to turn over the the uh, to, for her to MC uh, today's discussion. Dr. Ochowski is staff psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Be Behavioral Health at Lifespan and co-director of the Research to Practice and Policy Core of the Rhode Island. Hospital Injury Control Center for Biomedical Research Excellence. She is also an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at the Warren Alpert Medical School. And she holds the very important role of Deputy Title IX Coordinator for the Medical School. Dr. Ochowski completed her PhD in Clinical Psychology at Ohio University in the Laboratory for the Study and Prevention of Sexual Assault. She then completed her psychology residency here at Brown. Her research focuses on advancing, advancing excuse me, the development and evaluation of sexual assault prevention programs. She is a community-engaged researcher with a focus on implementation and dissemination science. She's co-edited two books, including Engaging Boys and Men in Sexual Assault Prevention, Theory, Research, and Practice, just a couple of years ago. So thank you everyone for joining us today and I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you so much, Dean Jane, for being here and bringing together this important, important panel on a very important topic for our medical school community. I'm gonna briefly introduce each of the panelists that are joining us today. And then they're going to be giving some more context to their work. Our first panelist is Alina Potts principal investigator of the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University. Dr. Potts is the principal investigator of the Empowered Aid Project at the Global Women's Institute. Her research builds on her experience responding to gender-based violence in a number of humanitarian emergencies with a focus on feminist participatory research in humanitarian settings. Our next panelist is Dr. Manuel Contreras Urbina, Senior Social Development Specialist at the World Bank. Dr. Contreras Urbina works as the World Bank's Senior Social Development Specialist for Latin America and the Caribbean on gender-based violence. He is a gender specialist with 25 years of national and international experience in gender and reproductive and sexual health research and programs. Our third panelist is Dr. Erica Hardy, Assistant Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and of Medicine and Clinical Educator at the Warren Albert Medical School. Dr. Hardy is an obstetric internist and infectious disease physician at Women and Infants Hospital, whose research interests include infectious disease in women, sexually transmitted infections, and trauma-informed acute medical care and follow-up of the sexual assault survivor. Our panelists today have so much really exciting work to share with you, and those brief introductions really don't do their work justice. So what we're gonna start off with is having each of the panelists give a bit more context about their work and how their work addresses gender-based violence broadly, as well as gender-based violence in conflict and humanitarian settings. So with that, Alina Potts, I'll turn it over to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work? 
Sure, and thank you very much, Lindsay, for the introduction. Um, welcome to everyone who's here today. Um, and my work, as Lindsay shared, spans um, practice and research. So I've worked both in responding to gender-based violence in a number of crisis settings um, with international organizations, mostly um, as well as the UN. And that really involved setting up services um, for survivors, but a really important element of that is ensuring those services are very broadly structured, so it's not stigmatizing, um, and so that survivors can access care without actually having to identify and say, I am a survivor of violence, to be able to access that care. Um, and the services that we provided were largely um, psychosocial in nature or, you know, skills building, um, often we, we provide services in the form of women and girls uh, centers, which offer a variety of activities. And then there's confidential access to um, you know, a healthcare provider or a caseworker that someone can talk to privately if they would like to um, seek services for, for violence. And so it's a way to kind of, again, offer these services in a way that's non-stigmatizing, that reaches um, many different women and girls and all of their diversity, but that offers those links to services that survivors need in a, in a safe and confidential way. Um, and the work I do now is, is research focused on violence prevention, working with many um, NGOs, local organizations, women's groups in, again, in, in conflict and crisis settings. Um, both uh, the two areas of focus that I'm mostly engaged in now. One is on looking at prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. So when trying to access aid that should be freely given, whether that's food or shelter or water, um, aid actors and their intermediaries can misuse their power to give aid and can abuse or exploit people in, in exchange for aid. So the work I'm doing is really focused on preventing that from happening um, from seeing it, you know, seeing when it does occur in my in my previous work. And then also um, the other piece of work, which may be especially of interest to this, this audience is working to strengthen the linkages between um, gender-based violence response services and mental health and psychosocial support services. So recognizing that survivors may have you know, mental health uh, needs, but also people living with different um, um, you know, mental health concerns may also be more at risk for certain forms of violence or their um, health care issues may be exacerbated by experiencing violence. And so we're really trying to bring those two communities together around best practice for survivors um, and supporting uh, linkages so that survivors can you know, access the full spectrum of care that's available in these settings. Um, so I'll stop there, but that's kind of an a overview of what I've done and what I'm doing now. Thank you so much. And if um, folks in the audience have questions about this work, you can feel free to put it in the question and answer um, spot on the Zoom, and I'll be sure to get those questions over to our panelists. Okay, Dr. Contreras Urbina, can you tell us a little bit more to contextualize your work in the space at the World Bank? Sure. Thank, thank you, Lindsay. And I apologize. I was a little late, but my computer crashed, and I've been in like many back-to-back -back meetings the whole day. So I really apologize about it. Um, but very, very, thank you again for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be in this conversation also with my friend, colleague Alina, who um, I know for uh, some, uh, from, from this work in several years now. Um, so um, I'm currently, in, in my job is uh, about um, the, basically to provide uh, the, guidance of a strategy of the work of a uh, gender based violence at the World Bank at global level. And the the work at the bank in GB, the, the bank is a relatively recent actor in this in this um, field. Not that because in the past uh, the bank hasn't done some work in research or program or supporting some of these issues. But now in I would say in the last eight years the bank has systematically created um a uh, structure to work on in the on gender based violence, including gender based violence in conflict and humanitarian. And they work in a very kind of like um relatively simple way is divided in two. One is to mitigate risks of two types of gender based violence that are sexual exploitation abuse and sexual harassment that occur within 
kind of in in the in within the frame of a bank project. So basically, the the bank uh, in the where that uh, the 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 way that the bank operates is that they implement projects in any kind of development sector can be projects that involve infrastructure, transport, energy, water, anything. And that project means that the, the implementer is the government. And the government, uh, let's think in like, for example, uh, the constructing a road in a in, in, uh, middle-low income country. So the, the, the bank with the government are constructing a road and the, the, the government, of course, uh, hire a contractor to, to build the road. So when the, the, this project is building the road, that can potentially create risks or exacerbate risks of sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment. So what the, as part of the due diligence of the bank is to try that any kind of development project like that do not exacerbate any of these situations and even mitigate them with some measures to try to work with the contractor, with all the actors, the government, etc., to mitigate these risks. That's one uh, part of the work. And then the other part of the work is to really contribute with the countries, and uh, especially the country level, in um, to, to, to promote the agenda of gender equality and elimination of gender-based violence. The bank has li like updating the gender strategy, the bank has a gender strategy, and then and the new gender strategy has a pillar about uh, eliminating gender-based violence. And how we do that, basically same thing, we identify opportunities where the bank can support the Cover the, any actors at the country level, government, civil society, etc., in any areas of gender-based violence, and that can be prevention, can be re response, can be protection, and also can be at policy level, programmatic level, or research level. So it can be a variety of like uh, actions, but, and also that the, that the action depends of the local context. And what the bank brings is basically financial and technical support. To that it includes, for example, things uh, uh, like Al Alina SAPE, strengthening services, um, um, addressing sexual exploitation and abuse, um, any any kind of that, of, and also working in conflict and humanitarian settings. So that's like a brief summary of the, the work at the bank. That. Thank you. And just reflecting on um, some of this context and the work that you both are doing. Um, one of the themes I'm noticing is looking at how gender-based violence occurs um, and can be influenced across multiple different levels of the social ecology. So Alina, talking about work that you're doing one-on-one -on -one with survivors, then also moving into the community and ensuring that there's community engagement um, with these projects, also looking at the organizational level and then the systems and government and policy level, because each of those systems are really critical um, to response and prevention. All right, Dr. Hardy, I'll turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit more um, uh, for those who don't know your work here locally at Brown um, about some of the work that you're doing. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to think of it and sort of coming down a little bit to our local level here and contextualizing it. But thank you. You know, I'm honored to be here in the company of my panelists and uh, moderator, Dr. Ochalski. And I'm, I'm really glad folks are taking a little bit of time from this beautiful day to uh, to. Uh, hear more about this important topic. So like some of my colleagues, I'm both a clinician and a clinical researcher. Um, you know, so as you mentioned, I completed my residency here at Brown in internal medicine and pediatrics combined residency program and had the opportunity to train with so many current mentors in this space. So I've learned from many people here at Brown and my work is really just a small piece of all the great work that's going on here locally. So I'm hoping I can represent some of that. Um, I then um, completed an infectious disease fellowship up in Boston and I worked pretty closely with the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center there um, in terms of survivor support. Um, and then I came back to Brown after infectious disease fellowship. So my, my clinical and research work really has focused on understanding how to optimize the medical care of the gender-based violence survivor, 
um, and, and also complex sexually transmitted infections, um, even more specifically an expertise in sexually transmitted infections in pregnant people and STIs um, surrounding really reproductive health. So quite broadly, um, I've done some work in genital tract immunology and HIV prevention, um, teaching postgraduate learners, um, you know, who have finished residency or fellowship about STI care, especially in pregnancy. Um, and also teaching trauma-informed care of gender-based uh, violent survivors to medical providers. So hopefully have been um, designing some innovative ways to do that. Um, and I run the sexual assault follow-up clinic here at Women and Infants, where is where I do most of my work and provide medical care um, day-to-day for survivors. And, and we'll talk more a little bit about this throughout the webinar. Um, I'm an HIV clinician, and so gender-based violence is really a well-known risk factor for HIV acquisition and transmission. And so I'm, I'm interested in um, uh, designing work that helps us understand more about that intersection overall to kind of decrease the risk of both. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some uh, trauma-based teaching that we have here locally available and really tried to partner with a lot of our local stakeholders, which we'll talk about to expand our resources here, our knowledge, our care options, and really tried to standardize the medical care, making sure all survivors are, are offered standard care in really a variety of settings here in Rhode Island. So that's just a uh, brief intro of what I've tried to do. Thank you so much. Yeah. I love how you point out how this issue of gender-based violence is connected to so many other public health problems, right? Yeah. So we might be working with survivors of gender-based violence in multiple different contexts. It might be might not be the presenting reason that they're coming to see a medical provider, but it can influence their care in so many different ways. So thank you. All right, let's move into the meat of our discussion today. Um, and, you know, recognizing that folks on, on this webinar today might have varying different levels of exposure um, or background to gender-based violence, I'm hoping we can start off just giving a bit of information about what gender-based violence includes broadly and then um, focus in more to how this um, looks either similar or different in conflict and humanitarian settings. So for that question, Alina, I'll turn it over to you. Could you share with us kind of when you think about gender-based violence, how you put that um, how you frame this issue? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, and in humanitarian settings, we actually have quite a lot of guidance, um, guidance documents and things to refer to. So what we often refer to um, when looking at kind of standards within the sector, within these types of contexts, are gu guidelines that come from what's called the Interagency Standing Committee or the IASC, which is the heads of kind of the major aid agencies. And so they, when they've all agreed to something and signed on to something, we can consider that guidance that we can refer to. Um, so the, the definition that I'll share is within the ISC guidelines around gender-based violence. Um, and that is that we can think of it as an umbrella term for any harmful act perpetrated against a person's will and based on socially ascribed um, or gendered differences between males and females. So that includes physical, sexual, or mental harm or suffering. It also includes threats of such acts, uh, coercion, deprivation of liberty. Um, and it's really the, the term is often used and kind of comes out of, you know, the larger um, movement to recognize how this systemic gender inequality, you know, along the binary between males and females, which exists everywhere in the world, you know, definitely here at home as well, um, is kind of this underlying driver. Um, and we often use the term survivor for someone who's experienced gender-based violence. Victim is also a term that can be used, neither is right or wrong. And if, you know, if someone has a preference, we definitely use the term that they prefer. Um, and of course, this idea of consent is very important and that consent is freely and voluntarily given. Um, in humanitarian settings, for example, I mentioned working in sexual exploitation and abuse. You know, if someone says, um, you know, if if you kind of meet with me later tonight, basically, if I can have a sexual relationship with you, I will give you more food, I will give you, ac you know, access to some kind of aid, um, and the person agrees because they need to feed their family, that is not consent that's freely given. Um, and so we really, um, we recognize that special attention should be given to females due to their greater vulnerabilities that have been um, well documented, but also the overarching discrimination you know, that that many different people of different um, 
identity's face is also kind of recognized as well. And a term that's often used, which you might hear um, um, often thought of synonymously as violence against women or violence against women and girls, that's often used as well. And I would say particularly in kind of wider global work, um, development work, domestic work, that term is often used. Um, so, you know, trying to break down some of the jargon, I know it's a lot, um, but hopefully that helps to understand kind of how this term is, is defined and used in humanitarian context. Thank you. I want to um, go into a little bit more about kind of perhaps even debunking some myths about what people think about gender-based violence in humanitarian um, and conflict settings um, and thinking more about how gender-based violence looks similar or perhaps different in these settings. Um, Dr. Contreras Urbina, could you fill us in on a little bit more of that? Are there any myths about how people think um, gender-based violence might look that you feel are important to counter? Sure. Well, first of all, I'll start answering this question, like to um, kind of um, remember what kind of are the causes of, of gender-based violence, right? The main cause is related to uh, the gender inequality and the patriarchal context of, 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 the, of the society. One other uh, root of violence is the culture of violence in that, in, in that environment. And then there are some kind of like, um, I would say, factors that uh, somehow help to trigger more situations of violence, like poverty, like uh, uh, use of alcohol, drugs, uh, uh, situations of like a natural disasters, humanitarian, etc. So, we, answering the first question about kind of like the difference with um, with what happened in gender race violence in 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 uh, conflict and humanitarian and in general is that basically this both the causes and the factors ex kind of exacerbate exacerbate uh, the a. a, a conflict, uh, or, or everything gets more, uh, like the, the gender order gets more patriarchal, there is more violence in the society, there is uh, situations of more uh, poverty, etc. So basically, the and all the types of violence that happen regularly in any context, basically happen again and more in conflict and humanitarian. Something that we have uh, seen is that uh, when we talk, like for example, when you're asking about myths, we think in gender race violence in, in conflict setting, more like uh, situations of sexual violence committed by armed actors. And of course that happened. But what we've seen is that the other types of violence um, including the most common ones in the society that is, for example, intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence also occur in conflict settings and also increase in conflict settings for the reasons I mentioned, because the factors also uh, are more exacerbated. So basically, when we talk about gender race violence in conflict and humanitarian, we are not only talking about this uh, sexual violence perpetrated by armed actors or related uh, uh, of sexual violence linked to the conflict directly. We are talking about a much broader um, situations of violence in, and mainly the main type of violence that happen in conflict and humanitarian is intimate partner violence perpetrated by a male against their wives. Uh, so it's um, basically, Again, it's, it's um, the situations, the types of violence happen in, in conflict, both basically in, 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 in a worse scenario and also in, with a lack of uh, resources, a more lack of resources for uh, survivors to look for support, a lack of governance to really some institutions to address this topic in prevention and respond, et cetera. So basically that creates an environment where it's more uh, challenging for, for survivors. And with, uh, uh, with, there's like a complete, uh, in some cases, complete impunity of all these types of gender-based violence. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving that perspective. And it gives me a good segue um, to switch a little bit to talking about clinical care. Um, so Alina, especially with your work in, in setting up these systems of care, um, could you tell us more about what are the challenges to getting clinical care to survivors of gender-based of gender-based violence and conflict and humanitarians? Uh, perhaps even an example of kind of how you had to navigate some of those challenges in your own work. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's challenges everywhere. Um, I've also worked as a, a rape crisis counselor in New York City with the hospitals there and um, also very challenging. But, um, but you know, thinking about humanitarian context specifically, um, there are the challenges that come with the context itself. So access, right? After a natural disaster, if you think of the earthquake in Haiti, um, you know, infrastructure was just destroyed um, it was hard for people to physically kind of move around, um, even when that's not the case. Um, again, because of these patriarchal norms that Manuel spoke to, um, in some places, women and girls movement is circumscribed and it's hard for them to move, to leave the house, to move independently because of different cultural norms. Um, and then also, you know, the providers available. So I can share from responses that I've worked in, um, for example, when first setting up um, responses for um, women and girls coming from Syria to Lebanon as refugees in 2012, um, so towards the beginning of the Syrian war, um, we were setting up programming in kind of some of the spaces in the country that they were coming to. And of course, Lebanon, you know, per capita, I think, hosts the highest number of refugees in the world. It's about one in four people is a refugee. Um, and so finding providers that we could refer to that had been trained in clinical care for sexual assault was actually really difficult. And this is something that we've spoken about, which is, you know, what is the medical education curriculum, right? Is that being included? Um, do people have access to that? The people that we found the, the at that time tended to actually have done their training outside of the country. Um, and so I think medical education is hugely important in ensuring that there are survivor or there are providers skilled to provide those services. Um, and then also something that's really important to think about is, you know, the survivors um, access to a service, you know, if they do choose to seek healthcare and really communicating the importance of that for some of the medications that are available um, for sexual assault or for, for rape, um, you know, their first interaction isn't with the nurse or the doctor, right? It's with potentially the guard at the gate mm -hmm. or the person working at reception. And if you think about some of these settings, you know, I can think of a very specific clinic uh, run by an NGO in North Lebanon, where you walk in and people are everywhere, right? They're they're everywhere. They're sitting kind of less than a foot away from you. This was obviously pre-COVID. Um, but um, you know, anything that you say about why you're there will be easily overheard by everybody. And so we have to really think about how can people access care, you know, confidentially, whether that means the physical space is confidential or whether it means that everybody gets through to a private triage and you know they're not made to say why they're coming um, at the reception point. Um, and, you know, also thinking about preferences. So in some locations, for example, when I worked inside of Syria, um, when people were being displaced into essentially olive groves, we were again looking for providers to connect to for referrals. Um, and the providers we talked to tended to be from further away, um, where the survivors in that location, they didn't really want to see people from their immediate community because they mm -hmm. didn't feel safe. They didn't feel like that would be a confidential service. So having providers that were from other parts of Syria um, actually felt safer to them. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's context specific. And we often do a rapid um, assessment where we look at kind of service mapping, what's available, how are they staffed? Are there female providers on hand? You know, all of these things. Um, but those are just a few few examples. Yeah, such important considerations considering that community context. And also I wanna highlight the importance of talking to survivors, really ensuring um, that the systems that you're setting up are well matched, matched to their needs. Um, so it also gives a really great segue, um, Dr. Hardy, to talking a little bit more about medical education. Um, I know you've done a really excellent work in this space and equipping the workforce, equipping practitioners, um, as you mentioned, Alina, is so very important. There, there might not be enough people trained to really address this issue in a trauma-informed way. So be great, Dr. Hardy, if you could tell, tell us a little bit more about medical education, also some of the, the work that you've done in this area to equip the workforce. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think importantly, um, there's a lot of people in our state kind of working to train the workforce and trauma informed care. And I think, uh, you know, Alina brings up a, a really good point that the first point of contact may not be that medical provider, it might not be in a, in a private place. So, you know, some of the work that we're doing here locally, um, we've started to optimize um, sexual assault forensic examiner programs. Um, you know, when someone experiences gender-based violence, there is, which Alina alluded to, there is medical care that's recommended. So in terms of um, sexually transmitted infection prevention, HIV prevention, uh, prevention of unwanted pregnancy, as well as forensic evidence collection, if that's an option, if a, and if a survivor chooses um, to collect this evidence, to decide about using it at a later date. And I think that's one thing that's important to know. They don't have to use that evidence um, right at that time and don't even have to decide about it at that time. You know, one of the challenges with, with gender-based violence in a conflict zone is really the ability to deliver that timely care, especially for HIV and STI prevention, emergency contraception, advocacy and support services. Um, just to give a little um, kind of medical information about the time context, um, HIV prevention medications, we usually start within 72 hours. Um, emergency contraception is within 120 hours, so five days. Um, and then DNA evidence collection, of course, becomes less helpful with time. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, we've done in terms of um, trying to increase uh, teaching in the, our local uh, workforce here is that um, with uh, Susan Duffy, who's a pediatric emergency room physician, uh, we've been uh, who's been really working in this space since before I came to Brown. We designed a virtual curriculum um, to address some of the barriers that we have with teaching medical professionals, especially busy emergency room um, clinicians. You know, every few years, um, as part of many curriculums and training programs. Um, a lot of us would come together and assemble experts in the field and, and might design a two day session to sort of learn about um, all the, um, a lot of the factors um, with uh, gender-based violence and care of, uh, of victims or survivors. It might be days of lectures, some simulated sessions in a sim center. Um, and this is challenging to arrange um, it based on schedules of the experts, schedules of the learners. Um, and so we initially modeled a virtual program um, kind of based on some of the trainings that had been done. We used to have to do trainings to prescribe medication assisted therapy for opioid use disorder, and those were all virtual. And so we thought, well, what if we could do this um, virtually? Um, and, um, uh, and there's many other programs like this. So we do have on the Brown Continuing Medical Education site um, an on-demand um, uh, eight module um, uh, program or curriculum, which um, goes through uh, a lot of different uh, areas of the care, special um, so of survivors. So, um, you know, I address addresses diversity, special populations, males, prisoners, um, and transgender people, gender fluid people. Um, and so, and other populations that might be at high risk. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so that it, it's now free for everybody to go through this. Um, and so hopefully this, hopefully this will help as well. Um, some of the medical students um, came to me several years back and wanted to learn about um, uh, being advocates for sexual assault survivors. And I think, and that was early in their medical education. Um, and so there's a course um, within our medical school um, where providers, uh, medical students can early in their training before they do their clinical rotations, um, if they'd like, can learn how to be um, an advocate and, and support people in the ER who are coming um, to the emergency room to seek care after sexual assault. And I think sort of contextualizing that experience is really helpful for them as they go forward to then become those medical providers. I think it gives them such a helpful perspective. And so that's some of the things that's going that we're doing locally to try to, um, you know, have some of this teaching in our curriculums um, to increase the workforce and people prepared to, to see people who have experienced gender-based violence. Absolutely. And it's, it's really wonderful to have that curriculum available and easily accessible through the Brown continuing education system. So there are folks on the call who are interested in accessing that program. Um, I'm sure Dr. Hardy or myself, we can get you information about how to, how to find that great program. Absolutely. All right. Let's switch gears a little bit. I want to, um, each of you is doing such innovative work in this spaces. 
um, and I'm hoping to spend a little bit of time having each of you discuss the way that um, your work is really gaining momentum to address the conditions that um, sustain gender-based violence or take action to reduce its occurrence and remedy harm. Um, so I'm hoping each of you can talk a little bit about where you see this work going, um, either broadly or within your organization or work, and perhaps even share a story about a particularly innovative program or research study that you've been a part of. Um, so I'm going to switch around our panelists and um, Dr. Contreras or I hope to start with you. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit more um, about a project or a story um, from one of the programs or research studies that you've been involved with that really um, really speaks to you about where this work is moving and its and its importance? Sure. Probably what I'm going to do is uh, start um, sharing more details about what means. Uh, for the bank to mitigate risks of sexual exploitation, abuse, sexual harassment. For that, we created some guidelines based on like the best practices we have on that. A lot of learning from, for example, what that is. the Alina's work and other institutions to basically to try to put safeguards in in these projects. And what exactly it means? What kind of like safeguard actions are in, 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 in mitigating this risk. Well, one is that all the actors in the, in the project receive some trainings, basic training about gender-based violence and about kind of like within the project, zero tolerance to, uh, to, to uh, uh, perpetrate an act of this. But not only that, I mean, it's also like awareness, you know, awareness about GBB, gender equality. Also, uh, the these uh, measures include some kind of awareness within the community about the topic, because also the community potentially, when imagine that it's like a project coming from like a, a big infrastructure project, the, the community does not necessarily... Uh, want to to necessarily talk about these issues or like because that like a, some in, in many cases they also involve development and economic opportunities for the community for the community so they don't it's, it can be risky also to uh, in, in many aspects to talk about these issues so basically we create this this awareness but in addition we ask all the workers at the project to sign codes of conduct. Codes of conduct that explicitly say not to commit any type of sexual exploitation abuse, any type of sexual harassment, or involve, involving in any sexual act with any minor under 18. It doesn't matter if the, if the worker is 19 years old or 20 years old. If the worker wants to work in this in that project, he cannot get involved in any sexual interaction with a minor. So that's another one. Then a third one that is very relevant of what the, uh, the, 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 my colleagues have mentioned is how, because any project of the bank has a grievance mechanism where, the, where people can report something, not necessarily a, an incident of, of gender-based violence, but anything, you know, like, if there is like a, the, the, the project is like someone broke his leg as part of the project or is creating a, like a, like cut a lot of trees and, and has like damage to the environment, something like that. But in some cases, that grievance mechanism are the, the, the and the people who are in the grievance mechanism are the first ones to receive the cases and with the, the, the report of the case. So we need to make sure that the people who receive that, who clearly are not necessarily uh, experts or on gender race violence, or necessarily who have the, the skills to provide psychosocial support or any kind of support to the, or legal support to the, to the survivor, but at least that they know what to do and treat the survivor in a way that what we call survivor center approach. That means with respect, confidentiality, non-discrimination, all that kind of stuff. But that person who receives, who can receive as again, any kind of complaint, 
knows how to deal also with survivors of gender-based violence. But in addition, that that person or that mechanism has all the links with the referral system with the in institutions that can provide that support to the survivors. So the person provides that, uh, that person in the green can provide that support to the survivor, for the survivor to make a decision in a voluntary way to try or not to find any particular support. So this is very important, all the training to the or, and, and the connection of the grievance mechanism with the services, but especially in conflict and humanitarian, there are locations where the bank is developing a project where there are no services, of course, or no services in um, a, close to the to to the to the um, that with a relatively easy access from for the community. So what is mandatory is that the bank provides some kind of like uh, services, like uh, put some, the project gives some funds to somehow provision of services, potentially even in the best scenario establishment of services like uh, that, um, that are sustained by, by the project and by the government that provides at least the basic, again, the basic support of psychosocial, legal, health and even a, a potentially livelihood and shelter. So that's one. So when you ask me about example, for me it's been great that the now the bank has developed all this kind of system to address these issues. Of course, there are many, I mean, what is like in the guidelines or are like the what is um, or 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 like like a these processes that we have it in, in, in papers to implement it, implementing it is very challenging and is very challenging uh, in, in a conflict and humanitarian. But the fact that we have a system is something really to, to um, an example of how the, the, this field has evolved in several institutions like the bank who recent like few a few years ago were not there and now there are more multilateral agencies banks etc that are uh, including sexual exploitation abuse and sexual harassment within their safeguard policies absolutely and it it shows how the thinking about gender-based violence has changed over the past 10 years, right? That this is kind of interconnected with multiple different systems and across organizations. So it might be an organizational context whose primary work isn't focused on violence, but we're seeing now that in the context of contracting, receiving governmental funding, that there's now a, a call and expectation that organizations do take steps both in prevention and response um, to ensure that the work that they're doing is not creating risk for harm, which is a, a, certainly a big step forward. All right, I wanna hear um, a little bit more in terms of storytelling um, for our panelists as we have just about 10 more minutes to go. Um, so Alina, I'm curious, what are, I'd love to hear from you about some of your recently completed work that you're really excited about um, and you feel like is really pushing the field forward. Sure. Um, well, I'll just speak briefly and I'll share a link in the chat. But, you know, something I've been working on now for about six years um, is a project called Empowered Aid. And that is using participatory action research to um, work with um, various members of refugee communities and with a group of about 30 refugee women and girls as co-researchers. Um, and so we look at risk of sexual exploitation and abuse when accessing different forms of aid and also what would make those aid distributions safer and then actually work with aid organizations to apply these recommendations. So it doesn't just kind of stop at you know the research findings, but then it really takes them and applies them using implementation science principles to understand, for example, um, you know, one thing that came up a lot around food distribution, um, not just risk at the distribution site, but, you know, often people get very heavy, huge amounts of food. Um, during COVID in Uganda, for example, to have 
you know, fewer distributions when people are together, they actually would distribute two months rations at once, which was a huge amount of food. And so to be able to get that back to where you're living, you know, can be really difficult. And the area we work in, for example, Northwest Uganda is a very rural area. People are very spread out over a large area. Um, and so exploitation can happen, for example, when negotiating rides on what are called boda boda, like motorcycle taxis, where maybe someone, they ask you for money or they ask you for some of your food, but they may also, you know, ask you for sex, essentially, to be able to transport the food home. And so um, this is a big issue that came out and we did a lot of education um, with aid actors to think about, you know, how are people able to get safely home? And also um, trainings for, you know, different transport drivers and really thinking about when we think about making aid safer, you know, it doesn't just stop at getting someone food. It's actually how do they get it home? How do they safely store it and use it? Um, and so that's just one example, but I'll share the website. We have a lot of materials there. We have a free online course, which is very interactive. It has case studies based on the research. And you can meet the co-researchers because they're actually the teachers in the course. Um, so I, I recommend that. Um, and I just recommend, you know, always, I think um, Erica mentioned this as well, but, you know, being, and, and you mentioned as well, and, and Manuel, all of us really, like, you know, these guiding principles um, and being survivor centered and, um, and really understanding and bringing people in, I think in my research, you know, who's answer who's asking the questions and who's answering the questions right and who are seen as the knowers or the experts here and i wouldn't consider that me but i think i can like help be a funnel of resources to people who have expertise and in this case um we talked to over 200 community members and again worked with 29 women and girls as co-researchers and they are tremendous experts on this so it's really about you know finding ways that we can document what they know and help use that to inform how humanitarian aid is delivered to make it safer. And that also gets at some of these underlying power imbalances because you know women are often left out of decision-making, refugees in general often left out of decision-making. So in the way that we do our work, whether that's designing a healthcare system or just interacting with clients or patients, you know we can all take small steps in how we kind of start to shift, help shift that power imbalance. Absolutely. Well, and as we get ready to close up the panel, um, I'm going to invite our attendees, if you have questions for the panelists, this would be a good time to start moving them into the chat because I have two more questions um, for our panelists before we start our wrap up. Um, and my first question, um, Alina, I'm actually going to turn right back to you because you've done so much work um, as a direct service provider in this space, um, my sense is that you have some really great recommendations of what providers who are working to address gender-based violence can do to buffer themselves from the secondary trauma, vicarious trauma that can happen working in this space. So I'd love to hear some thoughts about that. Sure, yes. And I know we're um, coming to the end. So I will quickly share a resource that I found helpful um, in my work, and I think um, you know you may find helpful as well. And I say quickly, but let me see if I can <laughs> navigate back to opening it quickly, um, because you know one thing to keep in mind is that working, whether you're working directly with um, with survivors as a clinician or a caseworker, et cetera, or whether you're doing research. Um, you know, there can be some vicarious trauma. Many people that do this work, you know, a third of people, third of women worldwide have faced some kind of physical or sexual violence and many people are survivors. Um, so this is a diagram. We will also, this will also be emailed out, I think with the, the recording. Um, and this is coming from the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence, but it's a great um, way to think about you know, in this case, the thinking about the victim's response and the worker's response. So this is within a social work framework. Um, but for example, you know, the victim or survivor may feel fear. Um, that may also come up, you know, for you. Um, and it may be, you know, you can see in this, uh, if we just go across the first kind of row, the fear of getting hurt again, or, you know, being rejected or being injured or killed. I mean, th these are very strong feelings that a victim or survivor can have. And then the worker, you know, you may also have fears of something happening to you of getting hurt, you know, specific phobias can develop. And so the second half is looking at what you can do. So for the victim or survivor, offering medical attention, offering safety options, you know, linking them to um, a caseworker to help support their other needs is very important. 
Um, but also for yourself, you know, not discounting your fears, establishing safety procedures. So especially if you're working, you know, maybe you walk home to your car late at night in a very dark area, or maybe you would feel better taking some self-defense courses. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think all of these emotions, denial, denial, overwhelm, discouragement, and ambivalence, and I wouldn't discount ambivalence. You know, we can get um, kind of burnout, right? And this kind of caregiving fatigue, and that's okay too. Um, and um, so I'll share this and also another resource in the chat that's directed at vicarious trauma for researchers. And I think, you know, just um, being aware that this can happen, knowing your warning signs, and then also knowing kind of your support system um, and reaching out is important. Thank you so much. What a great resource. And thank you for sharing it with the group. Um, we have just a few minutes. So Dr. Hardy, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Um, to um, you know, really think about as folks are hearing this information, they might be wondering what the local resources are, where they can go to learn more, or kind of if they have um, a survivor that they encounter in the context of care, um, what kind of local resources or things to keep in mind uh, might be particularly helpful for the members of the Brown University community um, and larger Rhode Island community that are here today? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think the I think starting with um, kind of survivors and uh, some of the programs that have been started here working to increase knowledge throughout the state. Um, you know, we talked about one of the challenges with gender-based violence, especially in complex zones, is the ability to deliver timely care. Some of the local specific resources, um, you know, to the Brown community as well as local Rhode Island community, um, there's, uh, there's day one, uh, which is treatment and advocacy, um, the Shepherd program, outpatient services through St. Mary's Home for Children. Um, they have a variety of support services. Sojourner House as well, um, support, advocacy, housing, education for victims and survivors. Um, uh, human trafficking, they have a program as well. Elizabeth Buffin Chase Center. Um, the Domestic Violence Center of South County, um, Blackstone Advocacy Center. Um, I think um, for thinking about providers as well, some of the, you know, I think it's so important what Alina said, like a, a not acknowledging that vicarious trauma, you know, thinking about infectious disease colleagues who were even worked in Ebola treatment centers, you know, there's reports of vicarious trauma through them. So I'll, I'll share a, a physician support line in the chat, which is helpful. Um, it's anonymous, uh, confidential, I think that's helpful. Um, at Brown specifically, there's the Brown University Wellness Center, CAP, um, and the Title IX office as well, as well as the Brown Be Well Health. They have a lot of online resources um, specifically surrounding gender-based violence and, and other as well. So um, yeah, those are a few that we have here locally. Thank you so much. And it really, th there's this invitation also to continue this conversation. Those of us that do work in gender-based violence um, here in Rhode Island, um, the connections that we have between agencies, between providers, researchers, practitioners, um, really make this work stronger when we're all working together um, and, and sharing our stories and our resources. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, so um, to close up for today, I'm not seeing any additional questions um, in the chat. Um, and I do want to um, thank everyone for being here to spend some time talking about this really very important issue um, that affects our, our work in so many ways. Um, so thank you for taking some time out of your day. And thank you to all of these esteemed panelists for being here and sharing your knowledge and experience and for doing this really important work that you do to make our communities safer um, and also to support those for those to support those who have been harmed. Okay. So without any questions to wrap up today, um, I'll turn it back to our panelists. Any closing thoughts, um, Dr. contreras Um, Well, I mean, just quickly that I, I, I've been in this field for, for many years and I have seen how really um, it has been evolved in terms of what we know and what we can do to um, to prevent and respond to gender race violence. And I've seen how evidence have and, and researchers have a uh, help and contribute to uh, really have like a better understanding of this, but also 
uh, the, the practitioners and the and especially the feminist movement has been key in in bringing this agenda now where uh, I mean and I know that there are still a lot a lot to do a lot of frustration because sometimes we see that the levels of gender reasons uh, don't 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 uh, are, are not are not decreasing or we don't have a strong system in place but I think we we have we have progress a lot um, uh, thanks to all these groups but I think we need to accelerate that change with uh, more investment with more um, resources and uh, and with the participation of of all the all all the actors and thanks again for for the invitation it's been a pleasure to be part of this discussion Absolutely. That's a great way to end. I'm thinking about accelerating this work and moving forward. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you for all the attendees. I wish you all a great rest of your day. Have a good evening. <laughs>